Let's talk about forces and how they affect everyday objects around us. First of all to note is that force is an example of a vector quantity in physics. What that means is it has a magnitude or size and a direction. So it matters whether I am apl applying a force up, down, left, right, etc. Scalar quantities in physics have a magnitude or size but no direction at all. So direction doesn't matter to them. Let's look at a couple of examples. So for a vector, obviously, um, we've got force is our first example. So it does need a direction, whereas something like mass doesn't need a direction. Something has a mass of 10 kilograms. It's not left or right, up or down. It just is. So velocity and speed, the one difference between them is velocity has a direction. So it's a vector, as is acceleration. Things like energy are not vectors. They do not have direction, whereas momentum is. Time is the other one that is a scalar because it only uh, doesn't have a direction as we perceive it. So let's talk about then this one topic of forces. So uh, we're going to look at Newton's laws. Now, Newton's laws can be seen as common sense, um, but to be able to describe how they affect um, like everyday objects does take a little bit of skill and a little bit of memorizing uh, the different applications. Now, I'm going to do them in reverse order. Uh, I'm going to talk about Newton's third law first, because I think it's the easiest and kind of builds up to the other three. So for Newton's third law, we're going to talk about this book on the table. Okay, um, It could be anything resting on any surface. It's still it's stationary, but that doesn't mean there aren't forces acting on it. We've got the book's weight acting downwards or gravity producing the book's weight acting downwards. Now, if it was just that force, it would fall through the table. So to balance it, there needs to be another force acting opposite to it. We call that the normal or the reaction force. Both names are absolutely valid. So because those forces are balanced, the book doesn't move. How we describe this force then in words is really, really, really important. Now, you can't just say uh, wishy-washy things like every action has an equal opposite reaction because you haven't even mentioned the word force in your um, uh, definition of Newton's third law. So what we'd do is we'd say for every pair of objects interacting, that means usually touching each other or coming close to each other, they exert equal and opposite forces on each other. So in this example, it's the surface of the book and the surface of the table, but it's always equal. It's always in the opposite direction. Okay, now let's then jump to Newton's first law. Okay, now Newton's third law is an example of a stationary object. We're going to look at the idea of a car. Okay, now the book's forces are balanced. Let's look at the car. When forces on an object are in equilibrium, that means balanced, the fancy word for balanced. Okay, the object will either do two things. So it will either be at rest or stationary, just like the book is, so it will remain stationary, or it will travel at a constant speed. So that constant speed is really important because people will forget about that, they'll think it's stationary. It's not always stationary, okay? So in this example, for the car, if it's already moving, let's say it's traveling down the motorway and the forces are balanced on it, it's not stationary initially, it's moving already, so therefore it is going to be traveling at a constant speed. If, however, it's parked in your driveway, it's going to stay parked in your driveway if the forces on it are balanced. Okay, let's talk about Newton's second law, uh, which is the one you don't really need to memorize because it's on your equation sheet this year. Uh, Newton's second law states that the resultant force on an object is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration. In words, you could say uh, acceleration is proportional to resultant force or um, mass is proportional to it as well. So resultant force, let's define that term quickly. It means the combined effect of multiple forces. I'll give you an example in a second, but that's in words what you'd say, the combined effect of multiple forces. So let's have a look at some forces acting on different objects and try to put some numbers to them because sometimes this topic is easier when we have numbers. So let's say I've got a ball here and I've got two forces acting on it. I've got 10 newtons up. I've got 20 newtons down. So the resultant force, because they're traveling in opposite directions, you subtract them. It would be 10 newtons in the downwards direction. Let's have a look at the second example. So this time I've got a um, different number of forces. So I've got 15 newtons up and 15 newtons down. Those arrows should be equal in size. And the resultant force, if you subtract them, is zero newtons, okay? Because 15 minus 15 is zero. Now, um, for that object, if it's already moving, then we say it travels at a constant speed because the forces are balanced or the resultant force is zero. This one here on the left, however, would be accelerating because there is a resultant force. The resultant force is downwards, so it accelerates or speeds up in the downwards direction. 
Okay, let's look at some slightly trickier examples. Now, these examples we're going to look at next, which contain forces not in the same uh, plane, um, is higher tier only. Okay, so I've got this example here where I've got 10 up, 35 down, 50 left, 40 right. You've got to resolve each one in the vertical and the horizontal direction. So 35 minus 10 is 25 downwards, and 50 minus 40 is 10 newtons to the left. But that still doesn't solve it. We can't then figure out which way the ball is going to go, okay? Now, this is an example. Uh, these things are examples of what's called a free body diagram, uh, which sounds really confusing, but it just means the diagrams we've drawn, a little dot with some forces drawn to scale. So you need a ruler to draw these, okay? Now, let's look at, have a look at what they can ask you that might be even trickier than uh, what we've looked at so far. So with this example, so I've got 25 down and I've got 10 newtons left. What you'd have to do to work out the overall resultant force is draw it to scale. So I'm going to use a scale of 2.5 centimetres is 25 newtons. So that means it's a scale of 1 centimetre is 10 newtons. And you need to draw it properly to scale. There will normally be a grid in your exam to be able to do this. And always write down your scale because that helps examiners figure out what you're doing. Now, once you've drawn this bit, um, that's the easy bit, unfortunately. Um, you then got to figure out, okay, um, how would I work out the resultant force? So what you then do, and again, use pencil because it's easy to go wrong with this, is you complete or round off the box that you've drawn out of those two forces. Okay, now this is usually a rectangle. It could be a parallelogram, okay, but usually it's a rectangle. Uh, and then you match up the force from the object to the corner. That's your resultant force. You've just found its direction. Then you measure it. So I've just measured mine. It happens to be three centimeters. Now using my scale, that means the resultant force is 30 newtons in the direction I've just shown. If you're asked for the direction, they'll tell you to find the direction. You use a protractor and you measure that angle there. It usually says below the horizontal um, or below a certain force, in which case you would just write down the angle measured with your protractor. Okay, so that's how you find your resultant force from two perpendicular forces or two forces that are not in the same plane. Now you can also be asked to do the opposite of this. Okay, what I mean by that is instead of starting off with two forces, you could be asked to find out the component forces Okay, let me show you what I mean. So a force of 300 newtons at an angle of 20 degrees, this is an example question, to the horizontal. So what you do is you get your protractor out. Now I don't have a protractor here, which uh, is just to save time, but I'm gonna draw out the force to scale. So it's 20 degrees from the horizontal, and I'm gonna use a scale, um, which I'll show you in a second. And the question will say, find the component forces. So component forces mean perpendicular forces that this force can be split into. So perpendicular means at 90 degrees. So what I'm gonna do is just draw out some uh, kind of 90 degrees uh, box of grid lines. Again, you do this to scale with a grid in an exam. And then what you do is you do the reverse of what we just did, where you gotta make up the rectangle out of two perpendicular forces. So just checking that's the right size. So you just draw in the one for now, make sure it goes to the height of the arrow and the width of the arrow. And then you're going to measure them. So this one happens to be 2.6 centimetres. That one happens to be 2 centimetres. Now for this question, the scale I've used is I've said that 1 centimetre is equal to 100 newtons. So out from that scale then, um, I can tell that the vertical force is now going to be 200 newtons. And the horizontal is going to be 260. And those are your component forces.